Dr. Meredith Pel Pelster. As I, when, when we were talking with Dr. Garmazzi, um, Garmazzi, excuse me, uh, he and Dr. Pelster just joined a year and a half ago at Tennessee Oncology and Sarah Cannon. And, and both of them are really, I just really appreciate being able to refer my patients, being able to call them on the phone, answer questions. And then particularly, you guys have been really helpful at One Oncology answering the dilemmas of have we reached the point that we need to adopt. So thank you for that work and thank you for talking today. Absolutely, thank you so much, Davey. I um, really appreciate the invitation and I'm looking forward to speaking with you all today about updates in the standard management of first line metastatic gastroesophageal cancers. Um, so really my goal is to tackle the question of immunotherapy in frontline GE cancers. So for the outline, we'll do just a little bit of background review setting the stage. We'll talk about the bottom line or what is the current standard of care for frontline treatment of GE cancers. We're gonna go over the data that inform that bottom line and then we're gonna delve a little bit into the controversy that remains regarding the use of immunotherapy in the PDL1 low or non-expressor population. So we know that gastroesophageal cancers are more prevalent in Asia, but they are still prevalent in our US population and are very important um, cancers um, that we treat. Gastric cancers um, have an incidence of about 22,000 per year and esophageal about 20,000. Um, about 10,000 patients a year die of gastric cancer and 16,000 of esophageal, so clearly an area of unmet need. There have been some recent changes in trends of subsets of gastroesophageal cancers with a decrease in the incidence of esophageal squamous cell, but an increase in esophageal and gastric cardia adenocarcinoma likely linked to increasing frequency of Barrett's esophagus. It's also important to remember that gastroesophageal cancers are a heterogeneous group. We have two different histologic subtypes, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And then we also have different anatomic subtypes with esophageal cancers, gastroesophageal junction cancers, and gastric cancers, including the cardia and of course the, the body of the stomach. And finally, we have some molecular subsets that's it, that it is important to recognize, notably HER2 positive cancers and MSI high or deficient MMR cancers. And so those two biomarkers, in addition to PDL1, are really the three biomarkers that are most important for gastric, uh, gastroesophageal cancers and are the ones that should be tested in all patients at the initial diagnosis of metastatic disease. So, what is the current standard of care for frontline GE cancers? The bottom line is that first line immunotherapy plus chemotherapy is FDA approved regardless of PDL1 expression. But there is still controversy about whether or not immunotherapy should be used in all cases. So, let's go over the data that support this bottom line. We're going to look at the five key trials. Um, that provide um, the background data here. And we're really gonna fly through the data because it's a lot. We're gonna focus on the inclusion criteria of the trials, the chemo backbones that were used, how PDL1 positivity was defined, and then of course the outcomes, uh, notably overall survival in the PDL1 positive and all comer populations. So first let's look at Checkmate 648. This trial is looking at chemo versus chemo plus nivolumab versus nivolumab and ipilimumab in esophageal squamous carcinoma only. The chemo backbone in the chemo groups here is 5-FU and cisplatin. And the primary endpoint was a co-endpoint of overall survival and progression-free survival in the PDL1 positive population defined as an expression of 1% or greater. This study did meet its overall survival primary endpoint with a median overall survival of 15.4 months in the uh, chemo nevo arm versus 9.1 months in the chemo alone arm with a hazard ratio of 0.54. There was also an improvement in overall survival in all patients regardless of PDL1 status shown in the all randomized graph. Median overall survival here was 13.2 months versus 10.7 months with a hazard ratio of 0.74. So you can see that the benefit is a bit less pronounced in the overall population um, compared to the PDL1 positive population. We see similar uh, results with progression free survival um, with a more pronounced improvement in 
progression-free survival for the PD-L1 positive group, um, and then, but still a trend toward improved progression-free survival in all randomized patients. Looking at the comparison of ipinevo versus chemo in this trial, we also see an improvement in overall survival in the PDL1 positive population, median overall survival 13.7 months versus 9.1 months. Um, this is also seen in all randomized patients, median overall survival with ipinevo 12.8 months versus 10.7 months with chemo. There is an interesting feature in these curves, though, that I'll note with a, a crossover, suggesting that there are some early deaths um, in some patients that receive ipinevo frontline. We see that the progression-free survival is actually not better um, with ipinevo versus chemo in either group, which is something that we've seen in other trials of uh, chemo versus IO, where we have an overall survival benefit, but maybe not necessarily a progression survival benefit. So these data from Checkmate 648 establish that both chemo plus nevo and ipinevo can be used in esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. So moving next to Checkmate 649, we're going to examine chemo plus nevo versus chemotherapy in gastric and esophageal adenocarcinomas. This trial used a, a chemo backbone of Fulfox or Zelox. It also had three arms like the prior trial, chemo, chemo-nevo, and ipinevo. However, in this case, the ipinevo arm was closed early, and we won't discuss any data from that. The primary endpoint of this study was, again, a combined endpoint of overall survival and progression-free survival in the pdl one positive population uh, defined as an expression of 5% or more. So we can see here again that the primary endpoint of overall survival was met. Um, the upper graph shows the PDL1 positive population with a median overall survival of 14.4 months with chemo nevo versus 11.1 months with chemo alone with a hazard ratio of 0.71. In the overall population of all PDL1 patients, median overall survival was 13.8 months with chemo nevo um, and 11.6 months with um, chemotherapy alone with a hazard ratio of 0.8. So again, we're seeing the same pattern of a less pronounced benefit in the overall population. Updated data um, with longer follow-up from this trial was presented at GI ASCO this year and continued to show an improvement in overall survival as well as progression-free survival in the overall population, um, which is depicted in these two curves. Also presented at GI ASCO was efficacy data for different PDL1 subgroups. So you can see the top forest plot here shows the hazard ratios for overall survival for various PDL1 subgroups. And you can kind of see um, the, um, the hazard ratios marching um, upwards um, from the lowest in the uh, uh, CPS greater than 10 um, to the um, to the uh, population that is um, greater than one. Now, for all of the low expressor populations in this plot, so less than one, less than five, and less than 10, we can see that the confidence intervals for these hazard ratios cross the line, um, which suggests that potentially these patients are not deriving the same benefit as the PDL1 positive population. And we can see a, a similar but less pronounced trend in the lower forest plot, which is for overall response rates. We're going to move on to the studies that looked at pembrolizumab. So Keynote 590 addressed pembrolizumab and chemotherapy versus chemotherapy in the frontline treatment of esophageal patients regardless of histology, so we're including squamous and adeno here. The chemo backbone was 5-FU and cisplatin, and the, the, this study had um, several primary endpoints. Uh, overall survival in the esophageal squamous population was analyzed. Overall survival in the CPS greater than or equal to 10 population, as well as the combination of esophageal squamous um, uh, uh, greater than 10 and both histologies with CPS greater than 10 and all randomized patients. So a very interesting trial design with a lot of endpoints uh, wrapped up into one. So when we first look at survival in 
all patients, uh, regardless of histology or pdl one expression, we see that there is an improvement in overall survival with Pembro chemo versus chemo alone, 12.4 months versus 9.8 months. Um, we also see an improvement in progression-free survival. And now looking at overall survival in some of the pre-specified subgroups, we also see a benefit to Pembro chemo in esophageal squamous pdl one positive, all comer esophageal squamous, and all histology pdl one positive. And we see similar uh, progression-free survival trends as well. However, when we look at some other subgroups that weren't included in the primary outcome, um, we see something a little bit different, or at least less pronounced. When we look at the adenocarcinoma population, which was a smaller population within this study, we see that there was a benefit in overall survival with Pembro chemo, 11.6 months versus 9.9 months, but that is less pronounced than what we've seen in other subgroups. And importantly, and, and we do not have a curve for this, um, but when we look at overall survival in the PDL1 low and negative group, CPS less than 10, the median overall survival with Pembro chemo was 10.5 months, and with chemo alone was 10.6 months, arguing that potentially the benefit of IO chemo in this trial was driven by the squamous cell patients as well as the PDL1 positive patients. Regardless, this study did establish the fact that we can use Pembro and chemo for esophageal cancers, regardless of histology. Next, let's look at Keynote 811, which evaluated trastuzumab and chemotherapy with or without Pembro in the HER2-positive gastric cancer space. The chemo used here was either cisplatin 5-FU or KPOX. The primary endpoint of this study is overall survival, um, which has not yet been reported, but there was a pre-planned interim analysis looking at objective response rate, which has been reported and has um, driven the approval of pembrolizumab in this space. So here we can see an impressive waterfall plot for the pembrolizumab group with an overall response rate of 74%. In the placebo group, the overall response rate was 52%. Taking a look at the subgroup analyses from this trial, we'll focus on PDL1. The PDL1 low population was quite small in this trial with only 35 patients. We do see that the hazard ratio um, crosses zero. Um, however, again, it's difficult to interpret with the, with the very small uh, sample size, the majority of patients here being PDL1 positive. Um, the um, approval, though, for pembrolizumab in this setting is, again, regardless of uh, PDL1 status. And the last trial that we'll look at data from is Keynote 62, pembrolizumab with or without chemo versus chemo in gastric adenocarcinomas only. Um, this trial um, was a negative study, um, so we'll go through it fairly quickly, uh, and included PDL1 positive patients only. Um, a CPS score of at least one. The primary endpoint was overall survival and progression-free survival in the PDL1 positive population, and this was analyzed both for CPS at least 10 as well as CPS at least one, which was the overall population. So first, let's look at the comparison of Pembro alone versus chemo in this group. We can see here that um, there was an improvement in overall survival for the CPS greater than or equal to 10 group, but not the CPS greater than or equal to one group. And progression-free survival was not significantly improved for either CPS subgroup in this trial. Looking at the next comparison, Pembro chemo versus chemo alone, we see that there was actually no significant difference in overall survival for either of the CPS subsets that were tested. And similarly, we did not see any improvement for um, uh, progression-free survival. And based on these data, pembrolizumab is not approved in this setting of uh, gastric adenocarcinoma. So we've gone through quite a bit of data um, with these five large trials. Um, and this summary table, um, we're not, I'm not intending to go through all of the data here, but it's just intended to depict that this space is complicated. 
Um, the uh, populations in each of the trials were slightly different. Um, the chemo regimens used in the trials uh, were somewhat different. PDL1 positivity was defined differently, and some of the endpoints of the studies um, were fairly complicated. Despite the complexities of all these data, the FDA indications um, for the use of immunotherapy in frontline GE cancers are actually pretty straightforward and are summarized in this table. What you'll note is there are no PDL1 cutoffs here. Um, so you can use chemo and immunotherapy in any of these subsets um, per the FDA um, indications. And looking specifically at the agents, um, chemo plus nivolumab is approved across the board in esophageal squamous, adeno, and gastric adeno. Pembrolizumab can be used with chemo in esophageal squamous um, adeno, um, but is not approved in gastric adeno. However, it is approved in HER2 gastric adeno uh, along with trastuzumab. And then ipinevo is only approved in the esophageal squamous cell carcinoma setting. In comparison to these FDA indications, the NCCN guidelines are more nuanced in their recommendations. And their recommendations are based on the PDL1 status as well as the chemo backbone. And category one recommendations are reserved for PDL1 positive settings and also with use of the chemo backbone that matched what was used in the trial um, that uh, led to the approval. So um, a bit more, um, uh, uh, not as free with the recommendations over when to use the anti-PD-1 agents. So coming back to the bottom line, we've gone over the data um, and the FDA indications um, that show that we can use immunotherapy plus chemo regardless of PDL1 expression. But there is still controversy about whether or not this should be done in all cases. So let's take um, a, a little bit uh, deeper of a look into this controversy. So some would argue that immunotherapy should be used in all of these cases regardless of PDL1 expression, while others would argue that there should be some restriction on the use. So let's talk about some points. Um, regarding why maybe we should restrict use of PD-1 agents um, in the uh, low or no expressing subgroups. So a really interesting paper came out, JCO 2021, um, that took a deep dive into these PD-L1 low or no expressing subgroups. And one interesting feature from some of the larger trials, um, such as Checkmate 649, is that we don't have data explicitly reported on the low expressors. So we have data on CPS greater than five, we have data on CPS um, greater than one, but what about CPS one to four? So investigators here were able to do a method um, KM subtraction and derive Kaplan-Meier curves for those patients uh, with CPS scores of one to four. And as you can see in the bottom two curves, one for overall survival and one for progression-free survival, um, there was no significant difference um, bet uh, between chemo plus uh, immunotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. Another thing these authors did was to summarize the hazard ratios for overall survival for IO chemo versus chemo in all of the PDL1 low or negative subgroups. And what you'll see on the forest plot in the, in the top figure, um, which is for overall survival, um, is that the hazard ratios are overall much more modest and very close to one and are all overlapping with one. Um, we see um, a similar effect for the progression-free survival forest plot. And overall, this can suggest that the hazard ratios for the overall all-comer population um, may be driven by the benefit that PDL1 positive patients receive, and these low or no expressors are just not deriving the same benefit. On the flip side, some would argue, well, maybe there is more than PDL1. Are there other factors that we should be considering when we're making the decision to add PDL1 to chemotherapy? 
Um, and this is a subgroup analysis, again from Checkmate 649, looking at some other factors. And what it highlights is that there may be some cases where other factors influence whether or not a patient has a better response to IO chemo versus chemo alone. For example, the presence of liver metastases and a higher baseline tumor burden uh, seem to be associated um, with um, a better hazard ratio uh, for um, the uh, IO chemo uh, combination. There's also considerable criticism of PDL1 as a biomarker. And entire conferences could be dedicated to this topic, and I'm only going to mention a couple of points. Um, one of which is that different assays are used, and there has been no prospective comparison of those assays in the gastroesophageal space. Um, positive predictive value and negative predictive value are not the same across tests. And I think probably one of the most important criticisms of PDL1 as a, as a biomarker is that PDL1 expression is heterogeneous. Um, the figures show that there is not complete concordance in PDL1 expression, um, either from primary site to, medic, to metastatic site, and there is also not concordance um, pre and post treatment. Expression can be different at sites, so spatially different, and it can be temporally different. So a one-time sample um, testing PDL1 may not reflect the biology of PDL1 um, in that patient um, at that moment or over time. So to summarize um, some of the arguments on either side of this debate, um, those that would argue we should be using IO in all patients um, might talk about the fact that PDL1 is not a perfect biomarker and may not always uh, predict anti PD1 response. Um, also, the results of very large phase three trials do show a benefit to the overall population. Um, and also, could argue that maybe we should be trying to maximize the chance of response in all patients. On the other side of this debate, you know, arguing against the use of immunotherapy in all PDL, um, or the, I'm sorry, arguing that we should restrict the use of immunotherapy to only PDL1 positive patients. Um, PDL1, it may not be a perfect biomarker, but it is the best one we have, and it does seem to separate out subsets of patients that have um, greater or lesser benefit with immunotherapy. Also, subgroup analyses of these trials really do not show convincing evidence. Um, that uh, anti-PD-1 agents add additional benefit in the no or low expressing subgroups. And maybe we should use pd one thresholds to avoid the cost of potentially futile drug. So we've gone over a lot of data that show that in general, immunotherapy and chemotherapy is a new standard of care for frontline gastroesophageal patients. Many newly diagnosed patients should be getting a fluoropyrimidine platinum chemo combination with anti-PD-1. However, there is still controversy about treatment of the PD-L1 negative and PD-L1 low populations. And based on the data that we have now, there really is no perfect answer about how we should address this. In my personal practice, I'm offering anti-PD-1 agents to all PD-L1 positive um, uh, patients that don't have a contraindication. And for those patients that are PDL1 negative or low expressing, I'm having an informed discussion with them um, about the um, potential risks and the potential lack of benefit. Um, I'm also taking into account some of the subgroups, notably esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, patients with liver mets, patients with higher disease burden, um, that even if they are PDL1 negative, perhaps those patients might derive some benefit. So I think this controversy is likely to continue, and we may never have a great answer, um, but it certainly continues to lead to lots of great um, discussions, um, both with patients um, and with colleagues, um, and continues to be a topic, I think, on every, every conference agenda. Um, so thank you guys so much um, for um, uh, going through all of this data with me. Thanks, Dr. Pelster. So. So I have to say it was a pretty, uh, it is a pretty confusing picture. Uh, our pathways group actually spent a lot of time trying to debate it back and forth, continuous discussions. 
Are we just going to leapfrog past this? And so not by bailiwick, lung cancer, additional immunotherapy agents. Is, is that how we're going to resolve this? It's like, okay, but there's going to be a lag three other IO drugs that, that answer this question. Potentially, I think potentially. There are certainly a lot of exciting trials that are adding to this. Um, you know, we have chemotherapy plus PD-1 plus TIGIT. Um, those trials are ongoing. Um, we have other targeted therapies um, that may enter the picture. Um, Quadin, for example, um, being a target in, in many gastric cancers, could that be a combination therapy? And would that rely on pdl one expression? I think that's a definite possibility. So we'll have this gap where we just don't really know, but we have developed other agents. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. Um, uh, genomic testing. We're asking on everything. When should you do it? Should you repeat it? What are your thoughts? Great question. Um, certainly, we should be doing her to either MMR or MSI and PDL1 upfront on all new metastatic patients. I favor going ahead and doing complete genomic profiling upfront, um, but at the minimum, those three should be done. And I do think that um, markers should be uh, reassessed over time. Um, something that, that comes up a lot is HER2 in particular, um, and reassessing HER2 as that can change over time and may no longer be a good target um, if it was used in the frontline setting and then patients lose their response. So. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, a few years ago at ASCO GI, there was, there was a lot of interest in uh, doing the NGS for esophageal, and a lot of uh, mutations were seen. And there was a lot of excitement regarding small molecular uh, uh, agents. Somehow they have disappeared from the scene. What happened? That's a great question, and you're you're right. We um, you know we we don't have a lot of molecularly targeted other than HER2 and um, and of course immunotherapy for MSI high. Um, we don't have any you know FDA approved um, you know um, agents in that setting. Um, certainly, there, are, uh, as we've heard from other speakers, there are a lot of molecularly targeted um, agents in basket trials. Um, but um, I think I think that that is an area of GE cancers um, that we we need more work in. Wonderful. Any other questions, Dr. Pelster? Thank you so much. <laughs>